Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Tom Toothaker's Ghost Story. What is it about that old house in Sherborne? said Aunt Nabby to Sam Lawson, as he sat drooping over the coals of a great fire one October evening. Aunt Lois was gone to Boston on a visit, and, the smart spice of her skepticism being absent, we felt more freedom to start our storyteller on one of his legends. Aunt Nabby sat trotting her knitting needles on a blue-mixed yarn stocking. Grandmama was knitting in unison on the other side of the fire. Grandfather sat studying the Boston Courier. The wind outside was sighing in fitful wails, creaking the pantry doors, occasionally puffing in a vicious gust down the broad throat of the chimney. It was a drizzly, sleety evening, and the wet lilac bushes now and then rattled and splashed against the window, as the wind moaned and whispered through them. We boys had made preparation for a comfortable evening. We had enticed Sam to the chimney corner and drawn him a mug of cider. We had set down a row of apples to roast on the hearth, which even now were giving faint sighs and sputters as their plump sides burst into genial heat. The big oak backlog simmered and bubbled and distilled large drops down amid the ashes and the great hickory forestick had just burned out into solid bright coals, faintly skimmed over with white ashes. The whole area of the chimney was full of sleepy warmth and brightness, just calculated to call forth fancies and visions. It only wanted someone now to set Sam off, and Aunt Nabby broached the ever-interesting subject of haunted houses. "'Well now, Miss Badger,' said Sam, "'I've been over there, and walked round that house considerable.' and I talked with Granny Holcomb and Aunt Polly, and they've pretty much come to the conclusion that they'll have to move out on it. You see these here noises? They keep them awake nights. And Aunt Polly, she gets hysterical, and Hannah Jane, she says, if they stay in the house, she can't live with them no longer. And what can them lone women do without Hannah Jane? Why, Hannah Jane, she says these two months past she's seen a woman, regular, walking up and down the front hall between twelve and one o'clock at night, and it's just the image and body of old Mam Tillotson, Parson Holcomb's mother, that everybody knowed was a thunderin' kind of woman that kept everything in a muss while she was alive. What the old critter's up to now, there ain't no knowing. Some folks seems to think it's a sign Granny Holcomb's time is coming. But Lord Massey, says she to me, says she, why, Sam, I don't know nothing what I've done, that Mam Tillotson should be set loose on me. Anyway, they've all got so nervy that Judd Holcomb has been up from Needham and is going to cart them all over to live with him. Jed, he's for hushing up on it, because he says it brings a bad name on the property. Well, I talked to Jed about it, and says I to Jed, says I, Now, if you'll take my advice, just you give that old house a regular overhauling and paint it over with a few coats of paint, and that'll clear em out, if anything will. Ghost is like bedbugs. They can't stand fresh paint, says I. They always clear out. I've seen it tried on a ship that got haunted. Why, Sam, do ships get haunted? To be sure they do. Haunted the worst kind. Why, I could tell you a story that'd make your hair rise on end, only I'm afraid of frightening the boys when they're just going to bed. Oh, you can't frighten Horace, said my grandmother. He will go out and sit there in the graveyard till nine o'clock at night, spite of all I tell him. Do tell, Sam, we urged. What was it about the ship? Sam lifted his mug of cider, deliberately turned it around and around in his hands, eyed it affectionately, took a long drink, and set it down in front of him on the hearth, and began. You remember how I told you I went to sea down east, when I was a boy, along with Tom Toothacre. Well, Tom, he reeled off a yarn one night that was about the toughest I ever had to pull it on. And it come all straight, too, from Tom. T'wasn't none of your hearsay. T'was what he'd seen with his own eyes. Now, there wasn't no nonsense about Tom, not a bit of it, and he wasn't afraid of the devil himself. And he generally saw through things about as straight as things could be seen through. This here happened when Tom was the mate of the albatross, and they was a-running up the banks for a fare of fish. The albatross was as handsome a craft as you'll ever see, and Cap'n Sim Witherspoon, he was skipper, 
A real nice, likely man he was. I heard Tom tell us here one night to the boys on the Brilliant, when they was all a settin' round the stove in the cabin, one foggy night that we was at anchor in Frenchman's Bay, and all kind of laying off loose. Tom, he said they was having a famous run up to the banks. There was a spankin' southerly that bloom along like all nature, and they was having the best kind of a time, when this here southerly brought a pesky fog down on em, and it grew thicker than hasty pudding. You see, that is the pester of these here southerlies. They're the biggest fog breeders there is going, and so, pretty soon, you couldn't see half a ship's length afore you. Well, they was all down to supper, except Dan Sawyer at the wheel, and there comes such a crash as if heaven and earth was a splitting, and then a scraping and a thumping and a bumping under the ship, and give em such a shove as the pot of beans went rolling, and brought up jam again in the bulkhead, and the fellers was keeled over, men and pork and beans kinder promiscuous. The devil, says Tom Toothacre, we've run down somebody. Look out up there. Dan, he shoved the helm hard down, and put her up to the wind, and sung out, Lordy Massey, we've struck her right amidships. Struck what, they all yelled, and tumbled up on deck. Why, a little schooner, says Dan, didn't see her till we was right on her. She gone down tack and sheet. Look, there's part of the wreck floating off, don't you see? Well, they didn't see, cause it was so thick you couldn't hardly see your hand afore your face. But they put about, and sent out a boat, and kind of searched around. But, Lordy Massey, you might as well have looked for a drop of water in the Atlantic Ocean. Whoever they was, it was all done gone and over with them for this life, poor critters. Tom says they felt confoundedly about it. But what could they do? Lordy Massey, what could any of us do? There's places where folks just let go because they has to. Things ain't as they want em, and they can't alter em. Sailors ain't so rough as they look. They're feeling creatures, come to put things right to em. And there wasn't one of em who wouldn't have worked all night at the chance of saving some of them poor fellows. But there twas, and there twant no use trying. Well, so they sailed on. And by and by the wind kind of chopped round the northeast, and then come round east, and sod in for one of them regular east blows and drizzles that takes the starch out of fellers more than a regular storm. So they concluded that they might well put into a little bay there and come to anchor. So they set an anchor watch and all turned in. Well, now comes the particular curious part of Tom's story. And it's more curious, because Tom was one that wouldn't have believed no other man that had told it. Tom was one of your sort of philosophers. He was for looking into things, and wasn't in no hurry about believing, so that this one was more remarkable on account of its being Tom who seen it, than if it had been others. Tom says that night he had a pesky toothache that sort of kept him grumbling and jumping, so he couldn't go to sleep, and he lay in his bunk, a turning this way and that, till long past twelve o'clock. Tom had a thwart ship bunk where he could see into every bunk on board except Bob Coffin's, and Bob was on the anchor watch. Well, he lay there, trying to go to sleep, hearing the men snoring like bullfrogs in a swamp, and watching the lantern a-swinging back and forward, and the sewesters and pea-jackets were kind of throwing their long shatters up and down as the vessel sort of rolled and pitched, for there was a heavy swell on, and then he'd hear Bob Coffin tramp, tramp, tramping overhead, for Bob had a pretty heavy foot of his own, and all sort of mixed up together with Tom's toothache, so he couldn't get to sleep. Finally, Tom, he bit off a great chaw of tobacco, and got it well sot in his cheek, and kind of turned over to lie on it to ease the pain. Well, he says he laid a spell, and dropped off into a sort of doze, when he woke in such a chill his teeth chattered, and the pain came on like a knife, and he bounced over, thinking the fire had gone out in the stove. Well, sure enough, he see a man a-crouching over the stove with his back to him, a-stretching out his hands to warm him. He had on a sewester and a pea-jacket, with a red tippet round his neck, and his clothes was dripping as if he'd just come in from a rain. What the devil, says Tom, and he rises right up and rubbed his eyes. Bill Bridges, says he, what shine be you up to now? For Bill was a master uneasy critter, and always a getting up and walking nights, and Tom, he thought it was Bill. 
But in a minute he looked over, and there, sure enough, was Bill, fast asleep in his bunk, mouth wide open, snoring like a Jericho ram's horn. Tom looked round, and counted every man in his bunk, and then says he, Who the devil is this? For there's Bob Coffin on deck, and the rest is all here. Well, Tom wasn't a man to be put under too easy. He had his thoughts about him always. And the first he thought in every pinch was what to do. So he sat considering for a minute, sort of winking his eyes to make sure he saw straight, when, sure enough, there come another man back and down the companionway. Well, there's Bob Coffin anyhow, says Tom to himself. But no, the other man, he turned. Tom see his face, and, sure as you live, it was the face of a dead corpse. Its eyes were sought, and it just came as still across the cabin, and sat down by the stove, and kind of shivered, and put out its hands as if it was getting warm. Tom said that there was a cold air round the cabin, as if an iceberg was coming near, and he felt cold chills running down his back, but he jumped out of his bunk and took a step forward. Speak, says he, who be you, and what do you want? They never spoke, nor looked up, but kept kind of shivering and crouching over the stove. Well, says Tom, I'll see who you be, anyhow. And he walked right up to the last man that had come in, and reached out to catch hold of his coat collar. But his hand just went through him like moonshine, and in a minute he all faded away, and when he turned around the other one was gone too. Tom stood there, looking this way and that, but there weren't nothing but the old stove, and the lantern swinging, and the men all snoring round in their bunks. Tom, he sung out to Bob Coffin, Hello up there, says he. But Bob never answered, and Tom, he went up, and found Bob down on his knees, his teeth a-chattering like a bag of nails, trying to say his prayers, and all he could think of was, Now I lay me, and he kept going that over and over. You see, boys, Bob was a dreadful, wicked, swearing critter, and hadn't said no prayer since he was a few years old, and it didn't come natural to him. Tom gave a grip on his collar and shook him. Hold your yop, said he. What are you howling about? What's up? Oh, Lordy Massey, says Bob. We're sent for, all of us. There's been two on em. Both of em went right by me. Well, Tom, he had his own thoughts, but he was bound to get to the bottom of things anyway. If it was the devil, well and good, he wanted to know it. Tom just wanted to have the matter settled one way or the other. So he got Bob sort of stroked down and made him tell what he saw. Bob, he stood to it that he was a-standin' right forward, a-leanin' on the windlass, and a kind of hummin' a tune, when he looked down and see a sort of queer light in the fog. And he went and took a look over the bow, when came up a man's head in a sort of sewester, and then a pair of hands, and catched at the bob stay. And then the whole figure of a man rose right out of the water, and climbed up on the martingale till he could reach the jib stay with his hands, and then he swung himself right over onto the bowsprit, and stepped aboard, and went past Bob, right aft, and down into the cabin. And he hadn't more than got down, afore he turned around, and there was another coming in over the bowsprit, and he went by him and down below. So there was two on him, just as Tom had seen in the cabin. Tom, he studied on it a spell, and finally says he, Bob, let you and me keep this here to ourselves, and see if it come again. If it don't, well and good. If it does, why, we'll see about it. But Tom, he told Captain Witherspoon, and the captain, he agreed to keep an eye out the next night but there wasn't nothing said to the rest of the men. Well, the next night they put Bill Bridges on the watch. The fog had lifted, and they had a fair wind, and was going on steady. The men all turned in and went fast asleep, except Captain Witherspoon, Tom, and Bob Coffin. Well, sure enough, twixt twelve and one o'clock, the same thing came over, only there was four men instead of two. They came in just so over the bowsprit, and they looked neither to the right or left, but climbed downstairs and sat down and crouched and shivered over the stove just like the others. Well, Bill Bridges, he came tearing down like a wild cat, frightened half out of his wits, screeching, Lord have mercy, we're all going to the devil, and then they all vanished. 
Now, Captain, what's to be done, says Tom? If these here fellows is to take passage, we can't do nothing with the boys, that's clear. Well, so it turned out, for, come next night, there was six of them to come in, and the story got round, and the boys was all on end. There wasn't no doing nothing with them. You see, it's always just so. Not but what dead folks is just as spectable as they were before they were dead. These might have been as good a fellers as any aboard, but that's human nature. The minute a feller's dead, why, you sort of don't know about him. It's kind of scary having him around, and so twant no wonder the boys didn't feel as if they could go on with the voyage if these here fellows was all to take passage. Come to look, too, there was considerable of a leak stove in the vessel, and the boys, they all stood to it, if they went farther, that they'd all go to the bottom. For, you see, once the story got a-going, every one on em saw a new thing every night. One of em saw the bait mill grindin, without no hands to grind it, and another saw fellers up aloft, workin' in the sails. Well, the fact was, they just had to put about and run back to Castine. Well, the owners, they hushed up things as best they could, and they put the vessel on the stocks, and worked her over, and put a new coat of paint on her, and called her the Betsy Ann, and she went on a good voyage to the banks, and brought home the biggest fare of fish that had been in a long time. And she's made good voyages ever since, and that just proved what I've been a-saying. There's nothing to drive out ghosts like fresh paint. The End